plasmas are really neat things. There's so many things you can do with them. Here is a fun demonstration as well. This is simply a glass ball with an electrode in it. Yeah, it's really not that simple. You see, inside of this glass is a thin layer of conductor. One end of this, again, AC, radial frequency, alternating power supply, is connected to the ball inside and one to the thin layer of metal inside the glass. And when I turn it on, I get a plasma. It's really pretty beautiful, and since I'm a plasma engineer and plasma physicist, I love just staring at it for hours on end. If I add capacitance from my hand, the ability to store charge, I can collect those tendrils to one spot. If I move my hand around, you can see that they move. They do tend to want to go up, but that's just because hot gas rises. And while mostly it's evacuated inside this ball, it's not a complete vacuum. And still, the currents are going to want that to go towards the top because it's getting warmer. Now, this, of course, is perfectly safe. You're not going to get any shocks from it. And if you just touch it with a piece of metal, nothing happens either. But if you touch it with two pieces of metal, I can make a capacitor. I have a uh, charge in here, and I can make another plasma discharge between the two quarters. See that? You can almost tell the pressure ratio between the gas inside there and the gas out here by the length of those tendrils compared to the length of these. It's clearly much less gas. I also like using this demo to say, hey, you can have the quarter if you want to touch it. There, of course, is a smart way to do that. You don't touch it with your finger. You just do it like this. So if you have a plasma ball, you can get a shock. Wow, exciting. But you know, this is a fairly common phenomenon. So there's lots of ways to generate static electricity, especially when there isn't very much humidity in the air. Rubbing a balloon, a plasma ball, or perhaps going down a slide. Got? Notice it's not a metal slide. But this boy has built up quite a bit of static charge. His hair is separated because they have charge on them that are repelling each other. And uh, he's probably in for an unpleasant surprise when he actually touches a metal object grounded to the earth. You've probably done some roll of things. And hopefully you haven't gotten a shock like this. This is from a Van de Graaff that's built up an enormous amount of potential difference. Air breaks down at about 3,000 volts for a millimeter. So if you've made that much charge on your body and you come to some object that's grounded, often that's a, um, a light box, a light switch, because of course it's grounded. You reach to turn on the light in the morning, you've been shuffling your feet because you just got up, and you get a shock. You won't die. But you know, if you keep getting a shock from the same outlet over and over, and it isn't because you are shuffling the feet, or it isn't because you've built up a lot of static charge, you might want to check that out. It could be that there's a live wire inside that's partially grounded. Of course, those are shocks, and they're kind of neat and kind of annoying. The fact that you can build up enough electrical charge, enough electric field to actually turn the air into a plasma. And nature does this in a big way. Lightning bolts. Lightning's very exciting. And as you know, lightning always comes with thunder because after we make this ionized channel of air, superheated air, a plasma, the air comes rushing back into it and you get thunder. This, which is a coil. I put a current through the coil, I make a magnetic field. 
I want to put a really big current through the coil, so I'm going to charge up this capacitor bank up to 12,000 volts. It'll take me just a few moments here because I'm using electricity now and basically storing it all so it can come out in one fell swoop, one giant bolt. And a bolt's a good word for it because I am going to make a lightning bolt. This device, called a chicken stick, for good reason, because I'm sure chicken to hold it, uh, is a ground, but the thing I'm going to touch with it is at 12,000 volts. And even though I'm going to push it in really fast, right before it touches, there'll be enough voltage to break down the air, and I will make a lightning bolt. Oh, well, you know what always comes with uh, lightning, right, is uh, thunder. So, protect my ears a little. Here we go. We're going to connect uh, ground to 12,000 volts manually. It wasn't so bad with the air protectors on. Okay. All right, now, when I do that, when I connect these two together, I'm going to get a very large current through a coil, well, through this coil. And getting a very large current through a coil will make a sudden change of a magnetic field. It will induce a current on this plain aluminum soda pop can. Just like two magnets can repel each other, this loop and this can will repel each other. Now, the loop's pretty stiff, can's pretty flimsy. There'll be a force inward on the can and outward on the loop. I wonder which one will win. Here we go. See which wins, the coil or the can. I think the can lost. So, how do we explain lightning? Well, the basic idea in lightning is that there is a cloud. Okay? And because of air currents in the cloud, there are tiny little ice crystals. And those little ice crystals will become charged as they're moving around, just like you become charged when you shuffle your feet on the ground. A little static build up here. But we need net charge. Water is quite polar, and in a cloud, the heavier water droplets fall, and the ice crystals rise, because it's colder up here. The water carries with it some net negative charge over time, and the ice crystals become net positive. And what this means is that the bottom of the cloud has a negative potential difference, the top of the cloud has a positive potential difference. Charge separation within the cloud itself. And this makes quite an electric field. The biggest shock you're going to get from an outlet or from shuffling your feet from static electricity, unless you have a Van de Graaff, isn't much because you can develop maybe a few thousand volt difference. Clouds can develop many millions of volts of difference. And therefore, when there's another object, like another cloud, all right, they can make a discharge. They can ionize the air that happens in between. And most of the lightning that occurs is cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning, like this. So, there's a few more things going on. Let's say we don't have the... Let's say we don't have the cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning, but we have the more traditional, even though less often occurring, cloud to ground lightning. Here's the ground. 
the voltage is not high enough to instantaneously break down this maybe mile, right, or two miles or several kilometers of distance between the cloud and the ground. And what happens instead is something called a stepped leader. And the origins of why this occurs are not totally proven, but the most likely explanation is there's always a shower of cosmic rays from outer space. When we talked about radiation, we talked about this as a constant background. 15,000 gamma rays going through your body every second. Clearly, there's cosmic rays and these gamma rays going through the Earth's atmosphere all the time. And occasionally, they are going to create some ionization, make a negative, positive pair in the air. Most of the time, this doesn't do anything. They just recombine, you know, a little, you know, charge in the air, no big deal. But let's say you happen to have a big thundercloud that's developing this large potential difference between the cloud and the ground. And we happen to have just a little charge here. Well, we're going to make a channel that's more conductive. This is the stepped leader, the negative leader. So if we have a little bit of charge, the air polarizes, some more ionizations occur. We haven't made a bright light yet. We haven't made a plasma, but we've created where here we had the potential difference. This is where we had the very large voltage. And now, this sort of area of net negative charge, this is the point. This is now at the same potential as the potential in the cloud. So the electric field, this electric field we need to exceed the three kilovolts per millimeter, we have to exceed that level. That electric field, same voltage difference, but now a shorter distance to the ground. Each of these steps in the leaders is about 50 meters long. Where's the next step going to go? Well, there's still a desire, still a force, right? The electric field pointing down. Um, but maybe the next one is going to go over this way. And, and then maybe one like this, closer and closer, getting to the ground. Sometimes another one might create over this way and then this branches, and maybe that one never quite makes it, right? Until finally we get one that's fairly close, and the gap here is small enough that this electric field is ready. Here's a good picture of some stepped leaders. You can see here you have many trails that didn't quite make it. But the main one, the one that's the brightest here, is the one that will actually have reached the ground. When the lightning finally does go off, all of these ionized channels are going to light up, even though the charge, the net charge, is going to be carried to the Earth in the one that hit. But we're not quite there yet. We've got a leader coming down to the ground. We have now a very high electric field between the tip of this point and the ground, and what happens is that you start getting a positive leader coming up from the ground. The electric field is large enough that we're actually going to start pulling charge up from the ground. We're actually shuttling it to the ground and making this a more positive point. These points are going to come from the objects that are closer to the clouds. In other words, a high object. Why? Because the electric field is higher. If it's a conductor, then you're going to have this opportunity to have a larger electric field between here and here than between here and here. So these stepped leaders that might come up from the ground are going to come from objects that are higher, like a tree. It's a beautiful filming of lightning hitting a tree, and it's just lit up the whole core. A tree is a conductor. It's got water going through it, right? And water is a conductor. In fact, it's got sap, so it's got water with stuff in it, and that's a really good conductor. And this is why you don't hide under a tree in a thunderstorm. Maybe you'll get a little less wet, 
but you could sure get an awful lot more dead or burnt. The stepped leader came up from this tree, connected to the lightning bolt, made an ionized path, and all of this charge can race down to the ground in a dramatic fashion. And the other stepped leaders, you know, these other things here, here, they're still going to light up. They're still going to become ionized plasma channels, even though they don't end up conducting the charge all the way to the Earth. This whole process, or at least the whole luminous process that you see, takes only 30 millionths of a second, 30 microseconds. You say, wait a minute, I thought that lightning on was on for a long time. Well, you see, that's the charge transfer once in the plasma that's created. But that channel is still ionized. All those electrons and ions haven't recombined yet. So when all this charge goes streaking down here, well, the conducting channel's still ready, so it can all go back, right? And then it can all go the other direction. Maybe three to four times, and there's been records that have seen it happen as many 30 times, the lightning bolt will blink on and off as the charge races to the ground, then races back, then races to the ground, until finally it's dissipated and the electric field's small enough and the recombination has happened enough so the path, the charged path, the conducting path is no longer there. And that takes place maybe 40 to 50 milliseconds apart. 0 0.04, 0 0.05, seconds, 20 times in a second. That's sort of the period it takes for each of these repetitions. So this is what's going on in a lightning bolt or getting a shock or playing with a plasma ball. Shock and awe, or at least shocks and lightning, and what you need to know about it.